this place again with your song flood our thoughts with wonder and awe give us a great a glimpse of a never changing God Storms and 
sorrows Still you won't let them steal away tomorrow We are gonna shine Yes, we are gonna shine for you everybody good to see you glad you are here with us let's continue in our time together all right what a blessing to share this time with all of you my friends near far pastor terry here we are continuing on with our fabric of faith series we're going to be talking about how we can add to our faith godliness in fact we're going to be hearing from one of our pastoral teaching members uh jonathan Arantes. And one of the things I love about Jonathan is when he teaches from the scriptures, it's always filled with joy and enthusiasm. You know, and I know you're going to be blessed by it. Speaking of blessing, I want to remind all of you about the opportunity to give, to honor the Lord with your generosity, your tithes and your offerings. It makes a difference. It allows us to reach people for Jesus and to do what we're doing right now. You know, before we hear from Jonathan, I want to also share some exciting news about how we are planning to build for tomorrow. Buildings are assembly places. They're places where plans are made. They're places where community come together. And if you want to think about it this way, the first place that God created was a garden, right? It was a space for communion. But then you have this pattern in the Older Testament of what we would call an altar. And an altar was something that was built stone upon stone as a place to meet with God. And then you take that one step further and you see the development of the temple. The idea of, of a body, a people coming together, gathering resource for the rebuilding or the building of a house for the Lord. I really think that's a great uh, idea for us to connect with. 
The idea that we too are invited to bring resource and to bring blessing as a means of creating a space to honor Jesus. And so what we are seeking to do now is to really truly rethink our space in light of the community that we think God wants us to become. Our plan right now is to return here in 2026. Now, we're preparing as if that's going to happen. It's in our heart. We sense that that's what the Lord wants for us to do. Uh, I realize there's a big section of our church that's actually never really connected themselves to the mission facility. And for you, this is gonna be a new adventure. We're not only talking about coming back to mission and re-embracing our building at a literal sense, we're also talking about this idea of building for our future. Like there's an investment. We're doing something together. We're building, it's, it's, it's not just the noun, it's the verb, right? It's this idea of action. Building for tomorrow means that we want to invest, invest in the development of all those who God brings into this space spiritually. It's not just a building, it is that, of course. It's about building into the next generation. It's about building into a future. It's about building into being a witness for Jesus in this city. And how does that happen? It happens when we come together. It happens when we are connecting. It becomes a place of life. It becomes a place where eternity meets with time and where God takes something that we're doing and extends it in ways we could have never imagined. There's a sense of legacy, but there's also a call for us to invest into what is ahead. And so that's gonna require us to take seriously uh, our need to be on the cutting edge of, of technology. We need to get everything updated. The last time we, we attempted to do something like this was probably, oh, I would say almost 30 years ago. We have to be able to engage things technically. We have to be able to be honest about the new world that we're living in. We want to be able to take what we're doing and share it abroad, engaging the culture as it is and creating new ways for us to speak life into it. We're asking you specifically to give, to give of your resources, to give beyond just your normal tithe and offering. You consider prayerfully investing and build for tomorrow. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan. If we haven't met yet, I'm part of the pastoral team here at Cornerstone SF Church. I oversee our youth ministry department. I lead a men's group with Pastor Terry, and I'm part of the teaching team. If it's your first time here, then greetings and welcome, my friends. You are loved. And if you're coming back and visiting us again, then welcome back, my friends. Let us know down in the chat box below. You know, I'm excited for today. It's an honor and a privilege really to be able to share with you, and I'm thrilled to know that the Lord is going to move today. By faith, I believe God has something in store for you. But before we head that way, join me in prayer, inviting the Lord into our space. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for today. We thank you, Lord, for another day of life. I thank you for those who are listening, and I ask that you bless them, God. Let the words that bring life not fall on death to ears, Lord. We ask that you continue to move. You're invited into this space and anoint the words that I speak. Let them not be mine, but let them be yours. We love you and we ask you all this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So we're continuing our series, The Fabric of Faith. And today we're gonna to be talking about what it means to add to our faith godliness. Now, the concept of godliness might be a little foreign to some of us. Um, we might not even know what the word means in itself, or we might have a skewed understanding of what it is. 
And as I've been wrestling with how to easily explain and break down godliness or godly living, I want to define the word godliness as conforming to the character of Jesus through our thoughts, feelings, desires, and action. In other words, mirroring Jesus. I've also come to realize that in part, godliness isn't based on behavior modifications, but it's founded on a relationship with Jesus. Without the foundation of a relationship with the Lord, we will never be able to add to our faith godliness. This relationship is the reason we choose to live out godliness and honor God. It's not because we want God, the Lord, to love us, but it is a response for our love for the Lord. As we move through this, um, this calling in our lives, I actually want to reconnect to the passage we've been sitting with and the different strands of the fabric of our faith. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 8, it says this, For this very reason, we make every effort to add to our faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, there it is, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if we possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so the Apostle Peter is wanting us to continue and to keep practicing and increasing in these areas he has listed. Then he gives us the reason as to why he wants us to grow in them so that we don't become ineffective and unproductive people for the Lord. The enemy wants to try to neutralize us so that we don't bring God honor or glory. Adding to our faith godliness is something we can all practice. And what a beautiful thing that is, because it means that every single one of us here can do it. Doesn't mean we'll be perfect at it, but it does mean we can all choose to mirror Jesus in our life and bring him honor and glory. If we were to ask ourselves the question, am I living a godly life? How do we answer that? Yes, no, maybe so. As I realized that godliness is founded on a relationship with Jesus, it started to make more sense to me. If we love Jesus and desire to honor him, then we should do what he commands us to do. Then we're living out godliness. And what are his commands? First is to love God with all of our mind, soul, and body. And the second is to love others as ourselves. But remember, we don't just land there once we start following Jesus. It takes time and it takes effort. There's a process to it all. Letting old habits go and learning new ones take time. So we are supposed to be training and practicing, and that requires effort and work. God desires for us to be people of godly character. He wants to transform us but we can only bloom into something beautiful with the help from our Heavenly Father. You know, I remember when I first started following Jesus and how difficult it was for me to let go and let God. There were certain things in my life that were very hard to change. Like the way I spoke, the music I listened to, my unhealthy patterns, some of the jokes that I would make. Some were easier than others to let go, but even now there's still some old tendencies and thinking embedded in me. But as I, as I keep pressing into the Lord through worship and reading his word, through prayer and plugging into my church community, I've allowed his goodness to continue the process of transforming me into someone who mirrors Jesus or who's living out godliness. God was and is pruning and weeding the things in my life that stunt my growth. And I know he's doing the same thing for all of us here. There's no skipping steps. Like I said earlier, there is no skipping steps. And I actually want to share something with you. For some of you, you might know that I'm a little bit of a plant daddy, <laughs> right? Or someone who just loves plants. 
If you've been here before and you've heard me spoke, then you know that I have well over 50 plants in my home that I've had for over a few years, and they're thriving, they're growing, they're beautiful. Here's a couple of photos of them. When I first started collecting, growing, propagating, and buying plants, I was really shocked that I was able to even just keep one alive. No joke. But over time, I noticed that with a little bit of research and understanding and effort, it wasn't that difficult. I remember when I learned, first learned how to sprout a seed, right? And it might not sound that exciting to you, but it really is. And you'll know in a minute. But one of my favorite ways to do this is actually getting a seed. Try this with an avocado seed. You get a seed, you wrap it in a paper towel, you damp it with a little bit of water, not so that it's soaking though, put it in a Ziploc bag and just put it away for about a month. And over time, you'll start to see the seeds sprout and, and the roots start to grow. And from there, you can plant it however you desire. There's many ways to sprout a seed, but this is my favorite. And actually, if I, I even done this with an, avo, uh, an avocado and a mango seed. And let me tell you, my friends, it works. You can do this with just about any seed. And you know, the beautiful thing about it too is that once you plant it, you start to see the transformation, the process happen over time. You still need to care for it and watch over it and water it, give it enough sunlight, but it's so beautiful to see life grow. I actually wanna show you a video of what it looks like as a seed is sprouting. Let's watch that together. Wow, what an amazing video. Let me ask you this question. At what point do you believe the seed becomes a flower or a tree? Is it a tree when it's a seed or when it breaks out of the ground, when it starts to produce leaves or when it starts to produce fruit? There is a process that happens when the seed starts to go through the growth stage until it reaches its fullest potential. Life was always there, but it didn't just happen overnight. It required effort and care for it to bloom into something so beautiful and exciting. And in the same way, godliness starts once we're made alive in Christ and finishes when we're reunited with him in this life or the next. But until then, it requires effort and training as we learn to honor God with our minds, our souls, and our bodies. There's a process that happens when we give our life to Jesus. And this is why we need to continue to press into the Lord and allow him to change us from the inside out. So remember, growing in godliness flows out of an intentional relationship with Jesus. And as we start to become more like him, we'll start to, through our thoughts and our actions, we'll start to live out godliness. We'll start to take root. There's some scripture that talks about training and practicing godliness in our lives and how to honor God. 
and not to be unproductive people like Peter said. And there's a passage that I believe that does a great job in showing us some of the areas we can train in. The Apostle Paul wrote two letters to a young man named Timothy. Now, Timothy was a young leader in the first century church, and Paul actually called him his uh, son in the faith. And Paul is trying to encourage Timothy to remain faithful. And my hope today is that the scripture does the same for us. So let's read together. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 to 16, it says this, Have nothing to do with irrelevant and silly myths. Rather, train yourselves for godliness. There it is. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially for those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, conduct, in love, in purity, in, in faith, in purity, until I come devote yourselves to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Do not neglect the gifts you have, which was given to you by the prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in these things so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching and on the teaching. Persist in this for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. What Paul is saying here is that training in godliness is relevant for not just for the future, but for today as well. It brings life to our dry bones. It brings honor to the living God. It gives the fellow believers and also non-believers an example of how to live a pleasing life for the Lord so that they may see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven, as Jesus said. These are just some of the reasons why godliness matters. I also notice that in the scripture uh, that we're all called to be training and practicing in the way of godliness, which means that every single one of us who loves Jesus and is choosing to honor him is capable of living godly lives. None of us is excluded from this. This is what God desires for us, and it's a beautiful thing. Another thing is we're all called to be an example to others. Paul was saying this, let's just be an example. And a part of living godly lives isn't just for us, but it's also for others around us. Jesus calls us his ambassadors, which means we represent God on earth. And what a beautiful honor given to us. Growing up, I didn't have an example of what godliness really looked like in my life. So for me, I really just gravitated towards the characteristics or the, the attitudes people had around me. And it wasn't until I started following Jesus that I started seeing what healthy and godly examples of living life looked like. And I'm so thankful for it, for people, men in my life, women in my life who lived godly lives, who are living godly lives. Okay, so the Apostle Paul lists a few things that we could practice in. He lists speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. And I want to focus on a couple of them for the remainder of our time today. And the first one I want to touch on is conduct. How we act in public and in private, which I also believe tie in to our speech as well. So if we were to do a self-analysis on our conduct, how would we rate ourselves? Are we the same person on Sundays than we are the other six days of the week? Do we try our best to hold ourselves to the same moral and ethical standards we read in scripture? Do we switch up how we speak when we're around certain people or the way we joke? In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 10, verses 31, he says this, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. How do we choose to glorify God in our everyday lives? Paul is telling Timothy to remember to be an example in our conduct. The same is true for every single one of us who desires to follow Jesus. 
One way we can be more aware of our conduct is by, this might be hard, asking people to keep us accountable. It's not an easy thing to do at first, but when we invite people who we trust will know, will call us out so that we honor God, we'll start to see growth in godliness happen. The second is faith or trusting in God's character and promises. The author of Hebrew writes this, faith is confident in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Hebrews chapter 11, verse one. Confidence in knowing Jesus's character and goodness and promises are true, not just because the Bible says it, but also because we've seen it in our lives and in the lives of others. Building up our faith and seeing and sharing our testimonies is one way we can do this. Paul is encouraging his son in the faith, Timothy, to be someone who is confident and trusting in God's goodness and his promises for his life. We want to be people who are exactly the same way. When things get hard or someone close to us is going through something traumatic, we're able to pray over them knowing that the Lord will work it out for their good. Or when we're going through hard times, how we respond really matters. Instead of responding the way the world says is okay, we lean on to the Lord as our anchor. A way we can build up our faith is by sharing our testimonies sharing with others what God is doing in our lives and how he has been moving and restoring us. You can write these things down so we can go back and remember them. If we think that we don't have any stories, I promise you, you do. We just might not be used to the way that God moves just yet. Another way we can build up our faith is by asking people what God is doing in their lives. Once again, testimony. How is the Lord moving? It's so encouraging to me when I hear the way that God is moving in someone's lives or the prayer requests that are being answered. Share your testimonies. The last one is purity. Not allowing the world to pervert our thoughts or our actions. Now this one is heavy. I don't know about you, but when I first would hear the word purity, I would only think of sexual purity. And even though that is part of it, there are many different areas of purity we all need to work on. We have spiritual purity, like having a pure heart that isn't self-seeking, but seeking separation from sin and worldliness. Then we have moral purity, like fleeing from sexual immorality, whether it is something we're looking at or we're engaging with that we know we shouldn't be. God desires for us to be people who are pure or even in our thought life and trying to not entertain unhealthy thought patterns that are destructive, but instead set in our minds on things above. God wants his people to be ones who are living godly and pure lives. What areas of purity do we need God to move in in our lives? In the same way of godliness, we will never be able to live pure lives if it's separated from Jesus. And allowing him to change us from the inside out, we will start to get closer to that. So let's spend time with the Lord, going on walks and talking to Jesus. And let's keep asking him to move in these areas. The Apostle Paul tells us to immerse ourselves in these things as we practice living out godliness. If this is something we want for our lives, then give it to the Lord today. Let's ask him to transform us into people who pursue godliness. Because godliness is an inward and outward expression of a heart transformed through a relationship with Jesus. Jesus said we could do nothing if we're not connected to him. It's not a human process. It's a God process. And my desire for us today, as our time comes to an end, is that you bloom. You bloom into something beautiful that mirrors Jesus because this world so desperately needs it. I want us to become people who, who the aroma of the love for the Lord, it just, it springs out. And when people see us living so differently, they wonder, why are you this way? 
And then we're able to point them back to Jesus. As we start to live out godly lives in our community with one another, we'll start to see a garden come together. And in the the same way that gardens have different plants and uh, colors and shapes, all of us collectively make up this garden. And we're all in this process together as we pursue godliness. But we got to remember, it's the gardener, the lover of our soul that is putting in the effort, the, the work. And the beautiful thing about that is that the Lord doesn't just quit on us. So my friends, before we move into our time of worship, I just want to pray over us and encourage us in the Lord to remember to fight the good fight. It's not going to always be easy. There's going to be times where we're feeling good. Like, I feel like I'm honoring you, Lord. And um, I feel like I'm living a godly life. And there's going to be times where we fall. But we get back up and we continue to press into the Lord. So even now, God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love for us. Holy Spirit, help us, help me live out a godly life, a life that honors you, a life that's so different than the way the world lives. When people see us, they wonder why, why are you so different in the way you speak and your conduct or, or you're always so hopeful, <laughs> so much faith. Wow, what a beautiful thing. And even though sometimes it might not come as cross as a compliment, what a compliment that really is, Lord, that we're choosing to honor you and live lives that are pleasing to you, that mirrors the son who was once dead but now is alive. What a beautiful thing. I ask that you anoint us today. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. What areas do we need to invite you in so that we can live out godly living as we add this strand to the fabric of our faith? We love you. We worship you. We praise you. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. My friends, be blessed today. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you got pain He's a pain taker He's a way maker If you need freedom, save it He's a prison shaking savior If you got chains, he's a chain breaker We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night We've all found ourselves worn out same old fire We've all run the things we know just ain't right But there's a better life There's a better life If you got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker can feel it, somebody testify, if you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify, testify.
Lord, will you help us to grow in godliness? Help us to grow in our relationship with you in such a way that it shows up in our lives, that it really does make a difference, not just in terms of how we settle things inside of us, but also in terms of how we bless those around us, especially those you've called us to love the best and the most. We know that there are some things that only you can do, and so we welcome you to do it. May you, loved one, be blessed in every way, in your spirit, in your soul, in your mind, and in your body, in Jesus' name. If you need freedom, save it. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, oh, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out the same old fight We've all run the things we know just ain't right But there's a better life There's a better life If you got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker Testify, testify